Well, check it out. I got me a new table saw. The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Typebond. Now, if you didn't see this move coming, that's okay. I've been critical, reasonably critical, of SawStop in the past, but I've also been complimentary, and a number of times I've admitted that if I didn't have a sponsorship with Powermatic, I'd probably have one in my shop. I'm speculating, but for me personally, I, I think the saw looks great. I think it's cool. If it's a matter of 200 bucks, I probably would spend the 200 bucks. It's impossible, I think, today to shop for a table saw and not give some thought to SawStop. They make a good quality saw. And the technology they have, obviously, they've got kind of a lock on it. So if you want that safety feature, you don't really have any other choices. Now, I'm in a, a unique situation here because I am sponsored by Powermatic. I don't even consider SawStop to be on my menu of options because of my sponsorship relationship. I think SawStop is a great technology, and I think anyone getting into the market right now or getting into the craft right now probably should be looking at SawStop as a you know top contender for their table saw. You know, it would be nice to have the safety feature, especially since I have an employee now, which kind of changes my mm -hmm. thoughts on, on risk and things like that. When it's only me, it's a, a different story. Um, <laughs> but understand that I've got a, a working relationship with Powermatic, um, and it would be really stupid of me to get a SawStop. Hmm. Maybe that's why I lost the sponsorship. Anyway, what I wanted to do today is give you my first impressions of this saw as a nearly 20 year user exclusively of Powermatic table saws. And let me be perfectly clear here, I didn't get rid of the PM2000 because it was a bad saw or that this is significantly better. I got rid of it because I wanted this new safety feature, but also because Powermatic is no longer a sponsor. So if you want more information on that, I did a video explaining the situation. I'll put a link in the description for you. So the model I went with is the 36 inch three horsepower PCS. The first thing you might be wondering is why did I go 36 instead of the full 52? Well, the way that I break down sheet goods is you usually with a track saw. So by the time I even get over here, my pieces are small enough that they're very easy to manage on a 36 inch table. And furthermore, a 52 inch table generally winds up just being a place to collect a bunch of crap. And I don't need any more of those than I already have. The other thing is I have more space now around the saw, which gives me more flexibility, more room for my walkways. And additionally, it just saves money. It's material that doesn't need to be there. So why spend the extra money on it? Now, SawStop also makes an industrial line. That's their IC saw. Uh, so why didn't I go with that? Well, I originally did when I first caught wind of the whole sponsorship thing changing over. I placed an order for the ICS that was back in October around Halloween roughly. And unfortunately, just with regular manufacturing delays that all across the board everybody is experiencing now. Plus, I think they had a recall on a particular part. It was just taking forever. It was mid-January, and I just kind of wanted to move forward with this. So doing a little more research, I kind of decided that the PCS would probably be enough for me. I mean, in reality, even a PM2000, that's more comparable to the ICS line, I think. And that's overkill. The, PC, the PM2000 is definitely overkill for the kind of woodworking that I do. While I do this professionally, and in the past I was, you know, a professional woodworker, I really build like a hobbyist. I just build what I want, you know, as time goes on, a piece at a time. And it's, this is not an industrial environment. I don't have tons of employees running through using the same saw. So I honestly thought that the PCS would be enough for me. And so far, that's proven to be the case. So the assembly went pretty well. I basically did it all by myself. It's not that difficult if you have an engine hoist to help counterbalance this thing, and especially if you have to get the saw body into a mobile base that could be a little bit tricky too honestly if you have a couple of friends it will make life a whole lot easier but my friend is an engine hoist now speaking of that mobile base the industrial mobile base is pretty darn good it's basically just a hydraulic system with big old casters on there you just give it a couple of pumps and this thing is up and moving around and you could lower it back down. Real nice. Now, one of the great features of the PM2000 was the integrated mobile system. So basically there's a set of casters inside. You turn the wheel a few thousand times and eventually it will lift you just a little bit off the ground. It wasn't perfect. Mine certainly wasn't perfect, but it worked and it got the job done and it's not there. And I mean, in a setup like mine, I don't have to move the saw often, but when I do, it's nice to have a system in place. So when I'm not using it, it's also nice to not see anything, right? So of course the mobile base here works really well 
well. It rides even better than the PM2000's integrated system did, but it's also much more noticeable. It's extra, uh, you know, meat and stuff around the saw. If you want to do a cabinet in here, you have to consider what you're going to do so that you don't interfere with this mobile base system. But that said, it's a great mobile base, but it's taking up a little bit more real estate. Now this extension table here is made of lightweight materials. It doesn't have a lot of weight to it. So having really big, thick, heavy legs on this extension, I could see why they went with these sort of anemic looking legs. Uh, they're very spindly and small, but I don't even know that you would need this on this size saw. You probably could go without this, um, but they're here. They do their job. They just look a little bit uh, tiny. So as I proceeded with the unboxing of the parts, I did notice a few things were, you know, lighter duty than I was used to with the PM2000. For instance, the rails seemed like they were made with a thinner gauge material. Uh, they were just overall lighter, both the front and the rear rail. The table itself is a little bit smaller, um, not a huge amount, but it's definitely a little bit smaller. And the knobs down here and on the side, the little locking mechanism there is a plastic knob and on the PM2000 it's metal. Not a big deal, but it's just something I noticed. That said, Everything else on this was surprisingly on par, if not maybe a little bit better than the PM2000. So it was a little bit of a give and take. Now the assembly was pretty straightforward. I've done you know, a number of table saws over the years, so none of it was new to me, but I was always anxious to see, do the instructions live up to the hype? I've always heard how great saw stops instructions are, and it is good. They've got like a hard poster that you could follow with a step-by-step. -step. It's got color-coded hardware blister packs so that you know exactly which components you're using at which part of the assembly process. And the manual itself, it's thick, it's beefy. There's a lot of extra information in there, not just about the braking system and how to live with that, but also, you know, like diagrams for add-ons that you might want to add to the table saw and push sticks and things along those lines. It's very hobbyist friendly. I don't mean that to be insulting in any way, but companies that uh, make products for hobbyists tend to make them a little bit more user friendly. There's a little more hand holding there. Whereas, uh, you know, companies that make things for industry generally will give you a very light manual with very little detail because you should know what to do with it, right? But uh, SawStop kind of has their toes in, in both arenas but they definitely are favoring the hobbyist by giving you so much information, and frankly, that is appreciated. As for calibration, that actually went pretty well. My table was nice and flat, uh, flat enough for anything I'm gonna use it for. And then the union here between the main table and the cast iron extensions, I don't really have any big discrepancies there to speak of, uh, so everything went pretty well. Even the blade being parallel to the slot, that was slightly off and needed some adjustment, but oh my gosh, did they come up with a great system for making that adjustment. Now this is almost impossible to film in a meaningful way, but let me explain it this way. On most saws, you could loosen the top with, you know, at least four bolts, and then you're usually using something like a dead blow hammer and tapping on it, checking, tapping, checking, tightening it down, then everything shifts again, and then you have to loosen it again. It can be a nightmare to get that slot parallel to the blade. On uh, this system, they came up with a way of using sort of set screws that actually move the trunnion bar that's in the back. So you loosen the top, and then you could take a little away from one screw and add a little on the other side. So you're actually pushing it one way or the other with a controlled motion and a quantifiable motion, right? So if you turn it a little bit, tighten everything down and check it and it's still a little bit off, well, then you can go back and actually turn it just a little bit more and move it back and forth. I've never seen anyone do it like that. And, you know, I've heard people complain about once you set it down, it will shift a little bit. I personally did not experience that. Uh, once I had the setting that I liked, tightened my bolts down on the main table and everything's been great since then. So kudos on coming up with a very user-friendly adjustment system that's usually anything but user-friendly. Now, regarding the fence, I know a lot of people complain about the bolts. Every time you have a bolt connecting the face, you end up with a dip or a valley there. I mean, that was certainly the case on my old Powermatic. Um, they have that like ultra high molecular weight plastic as their fence face. And every place you've got one of those bolts, you could look for a nice dip there. That said, I really didn't see that on mine. <laughs> the funny thing is when you take the face off, yeah, crooked as a, a dog's hind leg, as my stepdad would say. So I did wind up uh, swapping mine out for an aluminum extrusion. More on that, it was really the very super cool tools fence that got me into this whole extrusion thing and I really like having the T-Tracks. I will have a video coming up with some of these upgrades that you'll see here. We'll have more information on those in the future. But I did want to say that my fence was pretty darn straight and flat to begin with and I didn't really have any major problems with it. I just wanted more functionality out of the fence. Now one of my favorite features of this saw so far is the way that the fence works. Right, so you can see I've got very smooth motion side to side, 
and very little slop. And that slop typically translates to, as you're moving it across, you find a setting on the viewfinder, then you tighten the handle down and it corrects. Right? Almost every Biesemeyer style, T-square style fence like this that I've ever used has at least some of that. And it's kind of a pain in the butt if you're really trying to sneak up on a, a setting as you go to tighten it down, you find out what the real setting is. They have come up with a system here that's actually really cool. Now normally we adjust that setting on a saw with a couple of screws that push out some pads on the underside here. So as you tighten it up, this moves this way and it rides up against the rail a little bit more snug. But the problem is by the time you get some of that uh, backlash out of there, once, once it's riding a little bit more tight in there, it actually goes to being too tight. And then you can't move it easily, although you've removed the slop, right? So it's kind of a catch 22. In this case, SawStop has added some additional pads. These pads here on the front, actually as you adjust and first install this rail, part of that process is setting the spacing between the front bracket and this piece of plastic here. So if you get it set just right and then fine tune uh, with these other pads here, you can get this sucker riding left and right with almost no slop. Now, I don't think this is something that has to be unique to saw stop, by the way. You could buy this type of um, plastic material with an adhesive back, and you could probably install these on any style fence. Uh, I'd be curious to see if you could make it work the same way. This is also the first fence system I've seen that comes with two viewfinders. So you have the standard one on this side that you use every day, and then you have one on this side for an extra tape, which is also something I normally don't see. Now, truthfully, in my career, I've probably put the, the fence to the left of the saw maybe three times. Um, so it's not something I would use very often, but it's actually kind of cool that it's there because maybe you do use it a lot. You're gonna find this to be a nice little add-on. So now let's talk about the guard. <laughs> well, it's a guard. It's gonna do what guards do. It's gonna obstruct your view and get in your way, but it's going to protect your fingers. And this one, as far as guards go, is pretty well designed. They made it very easy to remove. You just loosen that handle there and then yank up on it. Just as easy to put in place if you wanna to switch to the riving knife. It's all very easy to work with. And they've given a whole lot of thought to the dust collection on this thing, which is really appreciated. Now, if you've watched my videos in the past, you've probably seen that what I typically use is a riving knife and an overarm guard. The reality is, how often was that guard down? Even though it was very easy to put down and, and get out of the way, I often had it out of the way and just relied on that riving knife. So I'm really gonna try to commit to using the stock guard here. I think it sets a good example. I have a lot of new woodworkers that watch you know, these videos and I wanna make sure that they see the safest example possible. It's just not always easy to do because guards really are a pain in the butt sometimes. The ironic thing though is if we all just use the guards, I don't know that this technology that SawStop has here would even be necessary, but I digress. <laughs> I'm still gonna try to use the guard as much as possible. And not only because of the safety factor, but the dust collection is actually really, really good. Now with a four inch connection to the cabinet and this inch and a half connection at the guard with a separate suction source, it's actually a dust extractor connected there. Gotta say the dust collection is pretty, pretty, pretty good. I'm not gonna say it's 100%, but when the blade is buried, meaning there's wood on both the left and the right side, as you're making that cut, it's really effective. There's hardly any dust escaping the guard here. And then when you look inside the cabinet, there's hardly any dust missing inside there as well. Usually, you know, if you have inadequate collection or maybe the way it's designed isn't very good, you're gonna end up accumulating a lot of dust just in the cabinet body, which you have to vacuum out once in a while. I mean, it could still happen here, but so far so good, that's a pretty good start. Another pleasant surprise is just how fast this blade stops. Check this out. So why is that important that the blade stops fast? Well, you'd be surprised to find out just how many injuries take place after a tool has been turned off. It's almost like something gets turned off in our brains. We turn a tool off, we assume it's off, right? So then you go to reach for an off cut, or maybe there's dusk and you're kind of wishing it out of the way with your hand, which is a really goofy thing to do, but people do it all the time. As a woodworking instructor, when I am teaching beginners in person, it's one of the things I'm always looking for and making sure I tell them ahead of time is like, don't grab the off cut, don't wish away. Use your, use your breath to blow dust out of the way. Don't use your hands. Uh, these are all things that can really hurt you 
literally, if the blade is still spinning. So the sooner these things stop, the safer they're gonna be. Now overall, performance-wise, I've got no complaints so far. I'm only two projects in. My current project is a lot of plywood. Um, so it's not really asking too much of the saw, but I don't have anything to complain about at this point. I haven't seen any warning signs. Uh, anytime I've cut solid wood and thicker solid wood, I haven't heard any complaints from the saw. You know, there are projects that I'll be doing in the future which work with, uh, you know, more dense species, thicker species. We'll see how that goes. Uh, just haven't gotten there yet. So, so far, so good. Now, of course, you can't really talk about saw stop thoroughly without talking about the brake system. How does that actually impact usage? Well, the way I like to look at it is it's almost like a saw stop tax, or maybe it's a, an insurance premium. That is, you have to be aware that there are extra steps involved. So you wanna to switch to a dado stack. It's a process that kind of sucks already, but now it's gonna suck a little bit more because you have to change out the cartridge. This is not the dado cartridge, but there's another one for dados. Pop that in there, make a slight adjustment to the height to get that height just right between the blade and the brake itself, and then you're good to go. It's just a few more minutes, right? So it's not that big of a deal, but it's an additional bit of extra work. You also have to be prepared for the possibility of accidental activations. If you have really moist wood, if you're cutting materials that the instruction manual told you not to cut, if you accidentally hit the blade with your miter gauge, that aluminum fence, and your hands touching that aluminum, it's gonna set it off. I see that all the time in the Saw Stop Facebook group. It's almost a rite of passage. I hope it doesn't happen to me, but you, you never know. But I consider that to be the Saw Stop tax, right? So if you want this safety feature, there are a few more things you have to be aware of, there are a few more things you're going to have to do, and there may be additional expenses should you accidentally activate it. But that's user error, so it's, you know, you can't blame SawStop for that. It's just the way that the system works. Keep in mind with this system, you can't use every dado stack that's out there. They have specific recommendations for that. Uh, and you can't use every standard blade that's out there. They recommend certain types of blades that are more effective with the braking system. So there's a few more things to be concerned about. All right, so that pretty much sums up my first impressions with this saw. I don't know that I'm gonna do a follow-up unless I have some you know, new discoveries, things I really don't like about it that I need to tell people about. Uh, don't think there's a need for any kind of in-depth review. I'm late to the game with saw stop here, so I don't know exactly what I'm adding to the conversation, but here we are. Keep in mind, in a couple of weeks, I'm gonna release a video showing all of these little upgrades you may have seen here, some pretty nifty little things, uh, little creature comforts that I added to the table saw, and uh, yeah, hopefully you enjoyed this. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. It's pretty clear as... <laughs> Try that again. I can't tell, do I have too much over my head? I think it'll be all right. So that's my first impressions of the new saw stop in my shop. That rhymed. That was a really stupid way to say that.